You're welcome back. It's time now for Off the Press. Uh, what are we lifting off the press this morning? Uh, we're looking at the headlines for or from some of our national dailies. And this morning, we're going to begin with The Guardian. That's be before we join our analyst that will be uh, talking with us. Uh, the Guardian begins. Guardian newspaper is the first uh, head, uh, newspaper that we're going to take. Okay, um, The Guardian leads with the story, Nigeria flares $3.5 billion gas in four years amid pollution revenue leakage concerns. You'll find that on uh, page six of The Guardian. Then we also have PDP governors meet in, as internal crisis heightens. Why Nigeria remains a country of concern in obnoxious wildlife trade. Okay, that's also part of the headlines. And uh, we have case against pension payment to former governors. Okay, those are headlines from The Guardian, and we will leave The Guardian now to go to The Punch newspaper. The Punch newspaper is next, and it leads with fuel smuggling persists in borders despite uh, subsidy removal. That's according to Customs boss. Uh, uh, the writers there on the story is Customs CG rejects border patrol orders crackdown on fuel smuggling cartels. NNPCL intercepts Cameroon-bound vessel uh, laden with 800,000 liters of stolen crude. Okay, smaller headlines there are uh, Lagos Airport runway light stolen, seven suspected. It's a very funny uh, piece of news there. Uh, the runway light stolen in Lagos uh, uh, Airport runway. Uh, PDP uh, Threatening fire and brimstone on Fayoshe. They said Fayoshe will pay for working against Atiku and the PDP. That's according to the NEC member. And NLC meets governors over fuel subsidy palliatives. Then there's this uh, troubling story from uh, Ilorin that uh, the Isheshe festival was stopped by the Emir. So there's a story about a Lebuibon child's Emir for stopping Isheshe festival. And then um, PDP demands transparency as Akir Dulu extends sick leave. That'll be all from uh, the punch, uh, though there are so many other headlines that uh, uh, we can read up on when we go to the punch. We'll move now to um, the Nation newspaper. Nation newspaper leads with 800,000 liters vessel with stolen crude intercepted, destroyed. Okay, uh, let's say the, the, the vessel has been destroyed. NNPCL security raises bar in crude theft battle. 64 illegal crude joints found. 77 illegal refineries destroyed. Well, I don't know whether that is a good thing or a bad thing. Obasanjo lashes lawmakers for fixing their own pay. And uh, the Tinubu targets 30 trillion naira revenue in three years. And finally, from the punch, uh, court orders INEC to suspend Adamawa Rek prosecution. Okay, so we'll move from the nation to the final newspaper for today. That's the uh, Daily Independent. Daily Independent leads with $3.2 billion customs project seen plunging Nigeria into debt trap. APC targets hauling 24 states with off-season guba poles. Okay. Um, and then we also have smaller uh, headlines here. Uh, ailing Governor Kerdulu extends medical leave indefinitely. That's on page 7. Ohaneze, Southeast political leaders to meet Tinubu over insecurity. Then, Police Service Commission appoints new police commissioners for Bayelsa and Bornu states. Okay, those are from the Daily Independent. Uh, newspaper this morning. Uh, we we'll still have the story of a passenger criticizing National Assembly over bloated salary packages. Uh, I thought there was a, a, a body that should do that, not the National Assembly themselves. 
court restrains INEC from prosecuting suspended Adama Warek. We've already taken that. So, but those are the headlines we can take this morning. Uh, but uh, we have someone to help us make sense uh, uh, in all this. We have Mr. Chris Kainde Wandu, member of um, the Institute of Arbitrators in the UK, chartered member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. He's talking to us from Lagos, Nigeria. Good morning and welcome to the program, Chris. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, let's start with the headlines uh, from uh, the, the, the Guardian newspaper, gas flaring. In fact, that was uh, on almost all the papers. Gas flaring in four years has cost Nigeria $3.9 billion, not Naira. Uh, another newspaper said $3.2 billion, but above $3 billion in five years. I'd like your comment on that. Um, that's a terrible development. Um, in law, um, during my uh, school days, um, we had a course um, called Oil and Gas. Um, it's a new course in law. Um, that is... Um, uh, was instead to be able to give uh, upcoming and uh, um, trained lawyers uh, uh, an idea of um, what is happening in the oil and gas industry here. So uh, there's a course specifically uh, for that industry, and um, it was an elective course. I took it, and um, we have the, the PI. We have the PI um, in the books. Um, there is a fine for flaring of gas because that gas can be converted um, into other uses, domestic use, and the rest of them. But what we've come to find out is that the oil um, companies rather find it cheaper for them to flare the gas and pay the fine. The fine is so low that anybody can just pay it. So, and that in itself comes with a lot of challenges. If you are, if you go into, especially Patakot. If we are, if you are, if you take a flight from Lagos and you are heading to south, the, the, the south side, either in Wari, Port or even Bayesa, uh, um, and even to the largest extent, your own state, uh, of course, you come to see that smoke, that large smoke that comes out, comes up, and it is not just the smoke; the effect on human beings. Uh, you come to realize that um, the apart from the air being polluted. People's, um, the people um, inheriting those smokes, some of them get to um, have cancer and several lung diseases. And in several countries of the world, advanced country, the gas flaring has been stopped. I still don't know why we cannot stop this. I still don't know why our government cannot put their feet down to make sure that we stop, make sure that this uh, part of the uh, contract we have with this um, oil producing uh, company is that there will be no flaring of gas. That is being done in several parts of the world. But here, yeah, we allow that, and you can see what is costing. What is costing? And so, if that those gases can be converted, if converted, it can be converted to uh, local gas, uh, domestic uh, gas, and that can be used. You can see how expensive gas is here. We can even have as much as possible to even um, to export. But that is what the situation is. And uh, we don't seem to have the political will to be able to do the need for. And that is why you're having a lot of environmental degradation in most parts of this um, 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 state of the South South. And by extension, is because when it's a when it evaporates into the air, it doesn't just stay in the, in the South South, it moves to other parts of the country and the world. And we are talking of um, the issue of global warming and the effect of global warming. This is part of the problem we have. So I think the greater government should look at the PIA as it were uh, that was passed and post stringent um, uh, measures and then um, also fine on um, oil um, companies to stop the flaring of gas. That we should bring it down to at past five to ten percent. By now, by what we have now, close to close to ninety percent flaring of gas um, in, by most of our oil companies, and that is on the when I think about this gas flaring, because I think it's something that should bring a lot of revenue, but I'm not an expert mm -hmm. in that field. But if gas, gas is what it is, 
it should be a source of energy in some way. And the fact that they're not converting this and they're just flaring it. And now we have been told that three, over three billion dollars in four years have been lost. In a country that is grappling with, with debts, country that is so, so at the brink of economic collapse, we're flaring gas that could have given us three point something billion dollars in four years. I just cannot wrap my head around it. But, well, now there's another story. Uh, this one is from uh, the Punch newspaper, and they say fuel smuggling persists amid uh, sub subsidy removal. So was subsidy removal supposed to also curb that? It is still continuing. What are your thoughts on it? I've always said that those are the lies that have been told just to be able to raise the price of uh, this petroleum product. Oh, yeah, about 50% of our uh, petroleum products uh, are smuggled uh, out of the country. It's cheaper in those countries. That is why we are having a high volume of the But if we remove the subsidy, it will reduce the lie. Lord, the lie, QED. Why? Because we have, we have one of the most poorest borders in the world. Other countries have a way of managing and uh, managing their borders. But we have, we have over close to over 500, if not up to 1,000 more than that, uh, board, uh, boarding points uh, into Nigeria, out of Nigeria. So how many are you going to man? Because the major ones are just about four or five. The one in maybe, the one in Meduki, the one in, in Seme, the one in uh, Ota, the one at uh, Madagri. Which other ones? The one um, in Cameroon, uh, between Nigeria and Cameroon, probably around Bakasa and the rest of them. Those are the ones that we, we know, the major ones that we, And that is where the customs, you see the customs and the immigration officers. There are thousands and thousands of other boarding points where most of these products are taken. So if you say you're removing subsidy, it does not deter them from exporting because it is see, it might just be cheaper despite the whatever you're removing. So the most important part is for us to be able to look at way of um, mapping our borders are making sure that we find a way of um, managing our borders to be able to make it less porous for um, the, this kind of thing. And it's not just um, fiscal presence. Most countries of the world are taking to technology. And with technology, they can do a map of the various exit points in their countries. And by so doing, you can be able to limit some of these things. But it's not that there's no country with total border protection. If you look at what is happening in the United States, remember the former um, president of the um, United States, Donald Trump, um, during his campaign, said that we were supposed to create a buffer zone between the United States and Mexico. Whether he was able to do that for within the four years is yet to be seen. Uh, but you can cop that to a minimum. So whether we, we increase our um, fuel to 1,000 per liter or 2,000 per liter, it will not deter those that are going to uh, export um, some of these things. So that is what the Controller General of uh, Immigration of uh, CG, Adeni have just said. And it's nothing new because the second one is the corruption within the system. It's still the same people that are um, within the NFPC and the rest of them that get this thing smuggled out. Remember what the former CG of uh, Customs says, where he doubted the so called 60 to 65 million uh, 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 um, liters of fuel. Um, that it will pay subsidy for every day in Nigeria. He said that Nigeria couldn't have been consuming that. Nigeria couldn't have been consuming that. And he went to war with uh, NMP that they should provide the necessary statistics to back that. NMP was not able to do that. Some time ago, some weeks back, the last week or so, we had that. Um, we have reduced the number of um, um, bar, um, liters of oil um, uh, domestic consumption has dropped by about 25%. All well and good. But saying that we can be able to stop the export of uh, petroleum products to other countries, that in itself is going to be a problem for me. I have said it time and time again, the way we can be able to reduce this high cost of petroleum products is by making sure that we revive our um, old refineries and build new ones so that we stop the importation. When we do this, the price will crash, and that will be it. But the way we are going now, nobody is talking about uh, reviving the refineries, nobody is talking about building new ones, all we are talking about importing, importing them. Even the Dangote that we ought to have started uh, production has been given a license to also import petroleum uh, products. Is that not an irony? Okay, uh, well, but do the people who are at the helm of affairs really 
want the price to crash because it seems as if there are stakeholders in these price hike and everything. They seem to be gaining. They seem to be shareholders in whatever company it is that is making these uh, prices to go up. And so as, as high as they go, they to make their profits. That's what you know, a lot of people will be thinking about because these are things that you should know. They are the basic things, ABCs, that you need to do, but they're not doing it. Over the years, not just this administration or the last administration, over the years, you wonder why uh, Nigerian leaders are not doing this. And today, you just mentioned something about the corruption in the system. I don't know whether this is the same thing playing out in this story in uh, the Nation newspaper that 800,000 liters vessel with stolen crude has been intercepted and destroyed. My problem is with the destroyed. How do you get that and then you destroy it? Where did the crude go after the destruction? Did you just destroy it with 800,000 liters inside? Or who took it out? I, I don't know. Let me get your comments on that. Um, today is what? Today is Tuesday, I think. Okay. Only one week ago, as a, on Wednesday, I was one of the few um, top uh, media personalities that I had the privilege of being invited by the Nigerian Army to have a one-on-one -on -one with the new chief of minister, uh, General um, T.A. Lagraja. And one of the questions I asked him, sir, is what are the strategy, what are the strategy are putting in place to be able to cop the security in Nigeria, and especially within the Nigeria Delta. And he said his priority areas um, include um, the manning of um, collaboration with um, relevant other uh, service agencies like Nigeria Air Force and Navy to be able to bring to the minimum, um, the areas minimum, um, stolen crude in the in the Niger Delta, uh, which is affecting the economy uh, of Nigeria, and uh, you provide that with what we are seeing, we are talking about. Of course, we know that um, crude have been stolen on the big basis, and it's not nothing new. And don't forget that in order to cope that problem, the federal government has to um, secure the services of um, uh, a security outfit led by Tom Polo to be able to handle that. And uh, some of us also know that the shuttling and shouting and waking up noise that has started to go, uh, that has been doing in the past few uh, weeks, uh, from not being between where he stays and uh, as well, it's also to get a chunk of that contract from the federal government so that he also he can also have a piece of the pie. Uh, but the fact remains that our oil has to be stolen and that the act yourself, oil are not stolen by uh, rookies like you and I. I don't even know what it takes. They are stolen by big time um, uh, people, quote unquote, big men, and uh, both in government and the private sector, who works in collaboration with uh, officials of the NNPC and other relevant agencies to be able to go. Because if you cut a vessel carrying 1,000 days of crude, you can imagine how many days it is going to take to load that crude. And the way it is done, that part of the didn't come down to the that particular bed remain in the high sea. Then you have smaller, uh, or, or smaller uh, tank that go to the creeks, get get this um, crude, then go and transload into the bigger bed, vessel, and that is what happened. And this happened for days and weeks. Are you saying that in the period of doing all that, nobody with the Nigerian Navy couldn't have seen um, that big tanker or tanker and the rest of them? That is one leg of the, the issue. Second leg is. This issue of destroying, destroying, destroying. And I asked myself, what do you destroy? If you seize the oil tanker, why do you want to destroy it? You have to evacuate the destiny. Make sure that um, the people are charged to court. Make sure that we have steep penalties um, to deal with issues like that. It confiscates the vessel and, if possible, auction it and pay the money into the coffers of the federal government. Mm -hmm. That is how it is done. So I don't know this idea every time that a vessel is uh, the next thing they just destroy. Somebody said one time that, oh, it's because that. Uh, and they just find their way uh, into out, and somebody, some people in government play some pranks, and so let us just destroy. By destroying that vessel, if that if that could is that means also degrading the, the the environment because that or that those products are going to um, be uh, we, we pour into the uh, into the waters, and that in itself will cause a lot of it. But if you are born, it's also destroying. But destroying also includes burning the vessel. That in this have pollution effect. So I think that we should be more uh, uh, intelligent enough and look for more creative way 
of handling issues like this than just every single time I get a person, the next thing will just set it on fire and it doesn't make any sense to me. It just gives me um, um, <laughs> an idea like, um, you know, uh, an accountant setting fire on the, uh, on the vault and then saying all the monies in the vault have been burnt because of that no, fire. No, let, 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 let me tell you this. Let me, yeah. Let me tell you let me tell you this. In law, we work with what is called evidence. Mm. Once you destroy an evidence, then it is very, very difficult for you to be able to prosecute that mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. So I will say that when you destroy the vessel, when the case is still in court, what are you going to have as an evidence to prove in court? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So it doesn't make any sense. So if it's, it's only the court, it's only the court that can make a pronouncement that go and destroy that vessel. You, as a, as a security agent, either in the military or whatever, have no right to destroy those vessels. Because what is, is the seas is, to a large extent, become the property of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You understand? It has left the uh, whatever Cameroon or whatever, whoever said. That's this thing. Remember, we believe there was one that was, that was carrying over one million um, barrel of um, crude oil that sailed out and got to Equatorial Guinea. Where it was stopped and was now, um, Nigeria authorities now went to me to bring that vessel back. I have not heard anything about that vessel again mm. till now. Whether they destroyed it, whether this, the case is still in course, whether it has been, uh, it has been forfeited. And, but that is how it goes. Let me give you the assurance that in the next three, four, five days, this news will pass away and you never hear anything about this vessel again. And those that were arrested, if any, and how they were prosecuted. That the, is how we work in Nigeria. The, the crude oil must have evaporated. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> we're, we're still continuing on fuel, this time around the fuel subsidy. Uh, the NLC is supposed to meet with governors over fuel subsidy palliative. Uh, I don't know. Uh, palliative. When you hear the word palliative, uh, COVID-19 palliatives come to mind and what people, what the governors and ho all the people that were supposed to be custodians of these things uh, did with the palliative. I don't know how comfortable you are by the government promising palliative and if it is going to work according to how it will be beneficial to Nigerians. What are your comments? For me, then I should forget the issue of palliative. They dropped the ball. Nigerians will have moved on. We have been paying for the fuel. Are we not paying for the subsidy? We are paying, we are buying fuel at 520. Having to be buying, having to be surviving. So what palliative are they talking about? They dropped the ball. When they had the initiative to be able to get the best out of government in terms of negotiation, they dropped the ball. The federal government went to the federal, uh, uh, um, went, to the, went to the court to get an injunction. The federal industrial, the industrial court to get an injunction. But the uh, NRC also had a leeway to be able to be able to tighten the knots around the government to get some level of commitment before um, postponing and calling off the strike. Then they left that and said, oh, okay, we are going to meet with government till August and which kind of palliative are we talking about? Are we not wasting time? For me, they are just wasting their time. That is why Nigerians don't believe um, these agencies or trade unions and rest of them. They are sellouts. They sell out. They are, it is our own personal selfish interest that are interested in. What are you telling? Why you know about uh, working out palliative? What palliative is government going to keep you? What palliative is the state government going to keep you? Does the state government sell well? They don't. Do they market well? They don't. So I think that is just a waste of our precious time. Nigerians have moved on and they're looking at the next level as it were. But the NIFC should be very, very careful. They are supposed to be the more of the eyes and the ears and the negotiating um, uh, uh, team. For the generality of Nigerians, and come to think of it, when you talk of palliatives, how many people does this palliative get? You've spoken about the one that happened in the COVID. You remember how we were fooled and we were deceived by the Minister of Monetary um, uh, Affairs, who told us that she was feeding our children during the COVID, even when our children were at, just at home. That they spent trillions and trillions of fiscal children and rest of them. They went uh, with, uh, further to say they were um, dashing out to. Um, uh, 5,000 naira, 10,000 naira to go vulnerable, uh, vulnerable within the society. This uh, vice president then, Oshibajo, uh, uh, headed that and was moved from one market to the other, which we saw was more like a wood buying anyway. And what happened to that? How many people got it? The, the, the National Assembly raised, uh, raised the issue and said that the, the list, the, the, what they have, uh, the log they have of names 
of people that were receiving this, and most of them are pretty sure what did you do about it. So, for me personally, uh, I don't know for other Nigerians, the issue of negotiation, negotiating for palliatives and the rest of them is just a smooth thing for just to deceive Nigerians and then to just focus on what they are doing and what that. Yeah, it's like We're saying it's like We're saying the road to the community is used by thieves. You cut off the road and then begin to give a little money to the exactly. uh, to the village exactly. villagers to say exactly. okay because you're not exactly. it's it's a terrible thing. Now, uh, the, gov the 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 president is targeting um 30 trillion trillion naira in 3 years in revenue. 3 years 30 trillion naira. So how he's going to go about this, I do not know. And some people are seeing that not as something to jubilate, but as something to be scared about. Because it seems for every little thing, we're just left to be taxed to, for, the, for the air that we're breathing in Nigeria. Is that the way to go about it? Uh, uh, three, yeah. uh, 30 trillion naira in three years. Is that achievable? And in a situation where the people will still breathe, uh, will, he, will he have that 30 trillion or we are going to be the ones to pay for the 30 trillion? Well, he has um, his work cut out. Uh, it doesn't need to give to this president his, uh, his ability to be able to manage resources. Uh, we saw what he did in Lagos and with, uh, with um, how uh, genuine, uh, ingenuity, his ingenuity in, in being able to move Lagos um, from what it used to be to the next level. But that is also going to be um, a just as rightly said. But good enough, we have set up a committee headed by an individual to look at the tax regime in Nigeria and see what can be done. But um, he has also started making money because remember subsidy, we had that. Well, how many days now? Within two weeks, that the, the government saved about 400 um, billion uh, naira. And so those are, the, those are some of the things um, I think is, is putting in place. My problem is not what it makes or what they're going to make. My problem is what are going to put it into use because most often they're not. You collect taxes from Nigeria, you make so much money from oil revenue, and there's nothing on ground to show for it. Nigerians continue to suffer on a daily basis. There is no basic infrastructure. Roads are bad. The hospitals um, you cannot dispense drugs. Um, schools are like comatose. Universities continue to go on strike. Um, doctors continue to go on strike. And so many them. So those are the issues for me. Uh, if when you look at it, you also look at the power sector. I personally think that, yes, our basic aim is one, to look at alternative means of making revenue, not just depending on 80%, 90% on oil. That's for me. We should be looking at agriculture. We should be looking at information technology. We should be looking at mineral resources like gold, uh, diamonds, um, or some of those other is Nigeria is where there's no state in this country that doesn't have a particular mineral that it can employ. Then we can look at our books. Good enough, um, there is a, a, a decentralization of power. Um, now the states are being allowed to be engaging in power, uh, in generation and distribution. Okay, fine. But we should also look at other ways. Then you are talking of tax action. Well, how many of our people are captured in the tax within the tax stream? But the question is, you also ask yourself, how many Nigerians are employed? We have a, one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. So, except you create jobs and make people to be able to get jobs, you will not be able to pay tax. That is the one hand. Then okay. the SMEs are dying. Okay, Chris, because Chris. You don't have to just a moment. Our, our, our time is really up, but I needed you to answer this, so I'm, I'm just going to ask you, and I hope that you're going to be very brief about it. Uh, the court orders INEC to suspend prosecuting Adamawa Reg. We find this kind of things so much. Uh, why is that? Why does that even exist? Uh, the former governor of Kanu State, uh, Ganduje also ran to the court so that they will not prosecute him. And uh, now the Adamawa Reg has gone to the courts, and courts are giving these injunctions, as it were. Why does this even happen? If you're innocent, why not just face the music, get your judgment, and get out? Why do these people keep running to the courts and the courts grant them these kind of injunctions? The issue is with the courts, not with the people that run to the courts. If the judiciary is doing the right, then who will get in this? If they come out and start their field and make sure that whoever is trying to get this thing, don't forget that these people are still seen as being innocent until they are on this program, but I don't see any reason why any court. But it didn't start today. You forgot what happened to former River State Governor, um, uh, what's his name, Peter Dilly. 
we are is uh, he went to the court i think up to certain point or so we are um, the, the the government was stopped from proving him perpetually he was stopped the courts we are stopped from we stopped the court stopped um, the federal government from prosecuting him or looking to then his wife was um, a member of the what well, the Supreme court so it's not today but i don't blame those going to the courts i blame the judiciary and this is where the angels will feel that angels to be able to come in and put down his feet on some of these judges that give these frivolous uh, injunctions that is um, not in the best interest of um, Nigerians and the people. Okay. It is it, very really annoying and so unbelievable it that is. somebody that a touch at is being stopped from prosecution. That is not good enough. Okay, well, uh, that's the much we can take today. Thank you so much, Chris, as usual, for coming on the show, and uh, uh, we're very grateful to you. Thank you very much. I have a wonderful day. Ahead. Okay. Uh, that's Chris uh, Mwandu, uh, who uh, has been talking to us, a member of the Institute of Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the UK. Uh, he spoke to us from Lagos here. We'll take a break now. When we return, we'll take our first hot topic. Stay with us.